When we talk about the fact that most people overcome addiction on their own, everybody's stunned. They say, no way. They don't believe it. Uh, and yet, the two most famous studies of opioid addiction prove the point completely. As I've been emphasizing since I first started in the addiction field, uh, beginning in 1975, when Archie Brodsky and I wrote Love and Addiction, uh, what we talked about in Love and Addiction was the Vietnam War, which in a sense was the largest experiment ever conducted uh, on narcotic addiction, where you took hundreds of thousands of ordinary American men and women, but mainly men, put them in a strange and alien environment and gave them virtually unlimited access to pure heroin. Even so, even despite the fact that so many of those men, more than half of them in Vietnam, used heroin, only a minority of them became addicted there. And the way we know that they were addicted there is a study was initiated in which men in Vietnam soldiers were selected based on the fact that when they were not able to get heroin, they went through withdrawal. So there was a classical definition of addiction involved. Um, and here's the remarkable things that were found. In addition to the fact that most of the men who did heroin didn't become addicted, of those who became addicted by the withdrawal symptoms in the study of following them up for three years, led by Lee Robbins, only 7% remained addicted by the end of three years back in the United States. Huh. Virtually none of them received treatment. Okay, I'm going to tell you another unbelievable thing that nobody believes. The men who did use narcotics back in the States, opioid narcotics, were no more likely to use them on a daily basis than they were to use marijuana or amphetamines. So if you define addiction as being using something on a regular daily basis, heroin's no more addictive than other drugs in America. Let's go on to other unbelievable things. Even the half who used the narcotic again in the United States, half of the men did, of that group, only 15% became addicted. So now we're back to the question of who were those 7% of the men who became re-addicted and remained re-addicted after being addicted in Vietnam. And what they found was that they were a group of men who were not well anchored in social connections in the States. They were more likely to have had antisocial behavior before leaving the States, and they were less likely to be part of a pro-social family organized community. They tended more to come from deprived backgrounds. Let's put that now in one corner, Vietnam. The second study, that famous study that disproves the normal view of opioid addiction is Rat Park. Uh, in Rat Park, a good companion, a good colleague of mine named Bruce Alexander, he had actually read Love and Addiction. And in Love and Addiction, we discussed the strange thing that happened. Archie and I visited the animal laboratories in Michigan to see what we could learn about animal addiction. And we were stunned to observe that the research involved monkeys in extremely small cages who were harnessed to a catheter injected into their back so that they could press a lever to produce opioid injections. Unbelievable. How is that a model? It's not even a model of animal addiction let alone a viewing addiction. And so Bruce conspired to create Rat Park, where he took rats, 
put them in the park, gave them opioid solution or choice of opioid solution, morphine and water and plain water, and they chose water. So he took this research one step further. He had them first habituated or addicted to the morphine solution in an isolated cage. Then he put them in Rat Park, which had saw, uh, sawdust all over, cylindrical, they had ferris wheels, and there were four male rats and four female rats. And the rats in Rat Park eschewed the morphine solution. Now, uh, Bruce and others tend to interpret that as indicating, well, if you could give them a nice environment, uh, rats won't choose to be addicted. They'll avoid addiction. I, there's a sexual component in there that I want to add up on. Um, rats have sex on the move. And if you were uh, morphinized, you weren't able to have sex. And so what Rat Park actually proves is that sex is a more powerful emotion, I'm sorry, motivation, than morphine, even among rats who were habituated or addicted to morphine. So what do these two studies tell us? Beyond the amazing information they provide, they tell us the ability to engage in ordinary life and social communities is the most important ingredient in recovery. Recovery is being able to participate in your community and the activities that they offer. It's so banal in a way. On the other hand, what use do we make of that information in real life. It's simple-minded, but kind of impossibly complex in some ways. You have to have communities for human beings to integrate into in the first place or to reintegrate into. And then you have to assist people's ability to live in these communities and to be a part of them. Quite recently, the Times ran an, immer ran an immersive long form opinion piece about the trials and the hopes of a revolutionary approach to a America's overdose crisis. I should say no organ publication has propagated the myths of addiction more thoroughly over more decades than the New York Times, but they've converted. Uh, they talk about a revolutionary approach to America's overdose crisis. It's an approach that I've been talking about uh, since love and addiction, again, a meaning addic of addiction that Zach Rhodes and I wrote about in outgrowing addiction. Uh, uh, the revolutionary approach is this, on point employs love and community. That includes providing people with clean needles so that they don't contract or spread HIV or hepatitis C, giving them overdose reversal medications like naloxone, and promoting supervised consumption so that if they overdose, they don't die, and helping the most vulnerable, which is who we're most concerned about, get access to housing and basic medical and mental health care so that they can live stably even when they are not abstinent. It's not about the drugs, it's about the life. Uh, the Times lectures us belatedly, this concept is known as harm reduction, and its chief goal is to save as many lives as possible. The key to doing that, the practitioners say, is to meet people where they are and to help them without judgment or condescension. I, I once appeared on a, a panel with Maya Salovitz so in a video on housing and addiction she said something that was very, very moving. She said, people valued methadone treatment because for the first time in their lives, somebody indicated that they cared whether they lived and died. After that point, after that simple making contact with the human being and showing a radical acceptance of them in Buddhist terms, 
what it com becomes about is interacting with them like normal human beings and now having them learn how to become a part of a regular community. And in our next TED's lecture, we're going to talk about how you make use of this input individually for your own person and when you're a helper. <laughs>